Hey, good morning, Integrity Church. How we doing? All right. My name is Ben. I'm one of the pastors here. We're so glad that you're here with us. If uh, you have your Bible, uh, go ahead and turn to the book of Esther. Uh, if you don't know where that is, open the middle of your Bible. It should be the Psalms. Go left, and uh, you can find Esther if you just turn really quickly. Um, if this is your first time here, we welcome you. We love to preach through books of the Bible here at Integrity, so we're just launching this series uh, in the book of Esther. We have a study guide for you uh, on our website that you can show you each week how we're breaking it down uh, and uh, give you a little overview of the book and why we chose this book. I think it's really uh, a timely book for even this season, and uh, it's amazing how uh, we plan these out uh, in a long period of time and how God just really meets us what, where we really are as a church and what we really need. And so I'm, I'm glad to jump into this book. Uh, two ways that you can uh, be connected. One, just come and attend on Sunday mornings, uh, dive into this book with us. But also, uh, we would love to see you in a small group. Um, and we would love to you to uh, show up at one of the groups that meet throughout the week in different people's homes and uh, different nights of the week. Um, you can find out more about small groups through uh, going to our lobby and asking some volunteers some questions about what they are. And they'd love to just plug you in to uh, one that might fit uh, where you live or what nights of the week work for you. Uh, we would love to see you in, in one of those. We want to do two things well as a church. We want to gather on Sunday morning and worship the Lord and respond to God's word, respond to the gospel together. And we want to scatter. We want to be uh, in community uh, with one another because that's really what the church um, is. And so if you want to know more information about that, uh, you can uh, just go to our website as well, uh, as, as well as our lobby, and uh, we, you can get plugged into a small group there. Another way you can get plugged in, if this is your first time here, you've been coming for uh, a short period of time, you want to know more, we have uh, something called Starting Point, and that happens uh, on a regular basis here at Integrity. It's a chance for you to come and learn more about who we are as a church, how to get more plugged in. And so uh, if you want to know more information about that, again, go to our website. There's a place you can sign up. It says Starting Point, and uh, our, our next one is October 3rd. Uh, we would love to uh, see you in those. So uh, we'll jump into Esther chapter 1. This is your first time here. Welcome. We're glad that you're here. You can connect with us on the connection card in front of you, and you have a chance to put that in later on uh, as in, in the service and as a basket will go by. Let me pray for us, and then we'll jump into what God has for us. Father, we are so grateful and so humbled to come before you as, as King Jesus, uh, the one who reigns supreme over all things, the one who's sovereign, the one who's uh, providentially working, even, the, even when it seems, uh, it seems that you are silent or absent. And Lord, you are going to remind us of that in this, this morning, in this word, in, in, in the text that we have this morning. So I pray, Lord, that what you show us in your word would help us to adore you more, uh, to worship you better, to uh, obey you, and to love you, and to become more like you. So God, I pray that your spirit would move and meet us here today as we open your word. Uh, it would guide us to uh, all truth of, of who you are and your character and your mighty glory. And so, God, I pray that you would change us today um, by the preaching of your word. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Esther chapter one is where we'll be this morning. Um, I'm really looking forward to uh, getting into this book as we begin the fall. And I know it's kind of interesting we called this the fall, even though it's not technically the fall. Um, but that's, this is what happens when uh, school starts back and we're not traveling as much and we're not going to the beach as much. But I, would, I will show you what I find interesting about the summer and the beach. I'm more of a mountain man, um, surprise. Um, and uh, I, my, the beach is kind of terrifying for me because every year uh, as we travel, travel uh, to the beach, the Discovery Channel is on, and we don't have cable, so every time I'm on vacation, we're staying in a place that has cable, and you just start watching it, and what happens every year during the summer on Discovery Channel every year once a week is what? Shark Week, and it always lands on the week that we are at the beach, and so what it does is it creates tremendous amount of fear for me, who's already not a great swimmer, uh, not, not an ocean person as much as I am uh, a mountain person, and here, like every single little shard of a seashell that rubs against my leg is a shark. Every piece of seaweed, every movement in the water is a shark, and it's, it's kind of funny because it creates this kind of fear that's kind of unnecessary. I mean, uh, one out of four, you have a one in four million chance of getting bitten 
uh, by a shark. And data shows that over the last 100 years in U.S. history, we only have like 1,500 uh, uh, recorded unprovoked shark attacks. And that's out of uh, hundreds of millions of us that travel uh, to the ocean every single year. And statistically, we have a higher chance of getting uh, struck by a lightning or dying of excessive cold than uh, die of a shark attack. But that doesn't matter, does it? Uh, because once we hear about one story or seeing a, one story of someone possibly seeing a shark, the ocean is no longer safe. And that's what we tell ourselves. And so what ends up happening is we do the same thing with God. As soon as a tragedy uh, takes place in our world, or as soon as one takes place in our country, we teach ourselves this narrative that uh, God is not safe. The world is not safe. God cannot be trusted. And we wonder, where is God? Why do these terrible things happen to us? Why are there earthquakes? Why are there tsunamis? Why are there wars? Why are there global pandemics? Yesterday was the anniversary of 9-11, and I can remember where I was when this tragic event took place. I was in uh, Bible college on my way to chapel and hearing about it. Couldn't believe it. Just an awestruck and felt that tension of where is God? Where is God in our world? Where's God in our country? I never experienced our country being attacked in my lifetime, and even though it's normal for a lot of countries, but I'd never seen a plane uh, crash into a building. And the reality is most of us haven't. But it's easy to say, where is God when things don't work out the way that we think that they should? But most days, planes don't crash into buildings. Uh, most days, planes are traveling 30,000 feet in the air at 600 plus miles per hour while we're eating a meal and uh, playing on a tablet in front of us or watching a, a movie. And in most days, this happens, but we, don't, we only ask the question of where's God when it doesn't happen the way we should. I mean, you think about how far we are as a, as a, as a world. I mean, you think about the Wright brothers taking flight in the first time a, a little over a century ago in North Carolina, by the way, and we are now flying at high speeds with occasional Wi-Fi. It's kind of crazy, right? And we wonder, where is God when these things don't happen the way that we, we should? We even wonder, where is God when Wi-Fi doesn't come through when it, when it should, right? <laughs> Wi-Fi doesn't work. Where is God? But Wi-Fi works most of the time, unless you live here, apparently. <laughs> most of the time, we live our lives without the pain that we often see. Most of the time, we live our lives without a global pandemic. But when diff diff difficult things happen, it's easy to question God's ex existence. It's e easy to be angry at God or even at times blame God. And I would even argue that it's actually human uh, to go through that. Maybe for some of you, you've lost a loved one. You've experienced divorce. You've experienced sickness, loss of income, loss of a job, loss of friendships, loneliness, uh, depression, uh, persecution. And for those things, when those things happen, it can sometimes be hard to remember who God is and what he's done. But one thing we have to remember that no matter what's happening, God is always present with us. God is always at work, even when we don't feel it, even when the world around us is crashing down. This is actually the story of Esther. The book of Esther is seen as this mysterious book in the Bible. Some wonder why it's even in the Bible. Martin Luther, for instance, the great Protestant reformer, um, he, he said he, 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 was, he was sad that the book of Esther was ever written, and he said that it shouldn't even be in the Bible. It's a pretty controversial book, and it's actually kind of hard to interpret. Funny thing is, I'm, I'm using uh, Karen Job's commentary uh, for this book, and she's done a st stellar job with it, uh, unpacking this book, and she actually said, it's probably not a good idea to preach or teach through the book of Esther. Welcome to integrity, right? <laughs> nowhere does the book show God's intention. Uh, nowhere does it ex explicitly uh, explain God's character or God's will. In fact, the name of God is not even mentioned in the book of Esther. 
Uh, you look at the Old Testament, and the Old Testament's filled with incredible miracles. Um, you, you see none of that in the book of Esther. Uh, you see where no one prays, or no one prophesies ex- explicitly, or no one uh, preaches. And you wonder where is God? You wonder where is God in the book of Esther? Uh, they, they, that might even be a, a literary device and the, the intent of the author not to explicitly explain God. But God doesn't speak in the book. What we see is he acts. He's working to accomplish his redemptive plan, even in the face of difficulty. And sadly, the book of Esther is a lot like our lives. Although we rarely pray to God, sometimes we even forget to speak of God, yet God still acts. When we don't speak or act, God is providentially and mysteriously moving through uh, ordinary things that happen to show off his glory. And that's what we're going to see in Esther chapter 1 this morning. So turn to Esther 1, if you will, if you're not already there yet. We'll start in verse 1. It says, now in the days of Assyrius, the Assyrius who was reigned from India to Ethiopia over uh, 127 providence. So ah- Ahasuerus, that's how you actually say it. Um, it sounds, it's an unusual name. It sounds like an, some obscure dinosaur, but I, I want to say this is King Xerxes. Uh, Xerxes was his Greek name. Ahasuerus was his Persian name. And historians say that during this time, and we'll refer to this character as Xerxes, um, he is in his mid-30s. He grew up wealthy. His father, Darius, was a legendary king. He ruled for um, 36 years and expanded his empire by conquering them and taking over nation after nation. This means that his kingdom, uh, Darius, his predecessor, his father, um, would have had a, a kingdom that would have spanned to multiple ethnicities, languages, and religions. And as Xerxes, or Ahasuerus, is, inherits this massive kingdom that he eventually takes over. And verse 1 helps us understand that. It says that he reigned from India to Ethiopia over 127 provinces. In other words, this day, in this day, this would make him the most powerful man on the earth. Today, this would be equivalent to a ruler that would have political and religious power over Egypt, Libya, Israel, Turkey, Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, all under one nation. Xerxes ruled roughly 3 million square miles. In some ways, he was like a god. In fact, he was treated as such. And look at what happens. Verse 2, in those days when King Xerxes sat on his royal throne in Susa, the capital, in the third year of his reign... He gave a feast for all of his officials and servants, the army of uh, Persia and Media, the uh, nobles and the governors and the providences were before him. When he showed the riches of his royal glory and splendor and pomp of his greatness for many days, 180 days. So you have King Xerxes, he has all this power, control, and money. He has all these armies protecting him. And what does he do with all of this money and power? He does what? He throws a massive party for himself. And parties are actually going to be a theme uh, in the book of Esther. In fact, there's about eight to ten banquets in this book. And this is just the first of several. But this party is like none other. The text says it's 180 days. So six months, a six-month party for the king. Some of you are, some of you students are like, hey, that's my first year of college. And hopefully not. Um, specifically like this, because Xerxes is spending this party celebrating himself. Notice verse 4 again. It says, while he showed the riches of what? It says, of his royal glory. Not only was this for his own glory, but this is also going to be uh, a ploy for his power. And this is one of the reasons why he was able to maintain control over such a massive kingdom for such a long period of time. He would invite all of his military and political leaders to this party to wine and dine them. This is how he would get loyalty. 
Some people wonder why Tom Brady always has the best offensive line. One of the reasons why is because he would always remember like his uh, offensive lineman's birthdays and throw parties for him, invite him to their house and cook him steak and give him the best food, and give him the best wine, and give him the best drink and treat him with hospitality. Why? Because those are the people who are protecting him. And that's a great idea, isn't it? I'm going to take care of the people who protect me. This is what Xerxes was, this is what Xerxes was doing for his people. I'm going, to, I'm going to wine and dine these people by throwing them this massive party, by feeding them and giving them the best food and drink and experience in the land. And he did it as a depraved man would. He would also use women and throw women at these leaders and men in order to um, get what they wanted from these women and treat them like objects. And this is what, this is what would happen when This is what will happen when unlimited power and wealth is given to the hands of depraved people. You would think with this kind of influence, one would use it for good, to feed the poor and help the needy and help the sick. No, throw a massive party used as a ploy for more power and self-worship. You see, God here seems absent. It seems like Xerxes is the one with all the power, three million square miles, all of these nations and lands worshiping him. But this control, we'll see later, is an illusion. Because working behind the scenes is the truer and better king. But in the meantime, we're going to see Xerxes and his vanity. Look at verse 6. It says, There were white cotton curtains, and violent hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple silver rods and marble pillars, and also uh, couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement, a porphyry, marble, uh, mo- uh, mother of pearl, and precious stones. Drinks served were served in golden vessels of different kinds, and royal wine was lavished according to the bounty of the king. And so you have gold couches, gold goblets at this party. This is a far cry from red solo cups. You have a six month vacation. Basically everything is given to you. This is what he's doing for his military friends. I mean, you think about someone offering you this six month, all inclusive vacation. All, everything is free. What can go wrong? Well, Everything. Look at verse 8. And drinking was, according to the addict, there was no compulsion. So in other words, there's no rules in the hands of depraved men. It says, for the king given orders to all the staff of all of his palace to do as each man desired. Verse 9, Queen Vasti, which is his wife, also gave a feast for the women in the palace that belonged to King Xerxes. And then it goes to verse 10. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, it's another word for drunk, he commanded, and I'm not even going to try to say it, seven people, (laughs) the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Xerxes. So we're not going to say their name, but they're seven eunuchs, so we're going to call them seven sad men. And if you want to know what a eunuch is, join a small group. That's a great question to lead off and ask your small group leader this week. You're welcome. Verse 11, to, to bring Queen Vasti before the king. So he's asked these seven sad men to bring Queen Vasti before the king with her royal crown in order to show all the people and the princesses, princes her beauty, for she was lovely to look at. So out of all this power and control, he asked his servants to bring this, his wife before this party and to prance around in order for this party to gawk at her. Early Jewish commentators actually say that he may have requested her to wear nothing but her crown. And this is a perversion and narcissism of Xerxes. He treats his wife like an object, a possession, a sexual trophy. This is a world seemingly without God. 
And when God is not exalted and man is, this is what happens. There's no respect for God. There's no respect for humankind. And the vulnerable end up being abused. Uh, Women and children are taken advantage of. And for Xerxes, his wife, his own wife, is seen as an object. It is sad and it is sick. And how does she respond to this request? Verse 12, but Queen Vasti refused to come at the king's command delivered by the eunuchs. I'm like, good for you, right? And, at the ki- and, the, and this king became enraged, and his anger burned within him. In the following verses, it shows that the king's anger, then it transfers to these seven eunuchs. They get angry and they begin to curse this woman in verses, um, uh, the, the verses all the way up to verse 16. They begin to curse this woman by saying, how dare she deny the king of this request? How dare she not show up? And how dare she ruin our party? She's wronged us. She's wronged the king. And so one of the eunuchs comes before Xerxes, and he says this in verse 12, for the queen's behavior will be made known to all women, causing them to look at their husbands with contempt, since they will say, King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, and she did not come. The very day the noble woman of Persia and Media have, who've heard of the queen's behavior will say the same to all the king's officials, and there will be contempt and a wrath in penalty. Do you see what's happening here? The, the eunuchs are saying to the king, king, if you don't do something about your wife, not following your orders, the kingdom might be filled with strong women who have their own opinions. Oh no, right? Do you see what they're afraid of? They're afraid that women might actually be biblical, that God's design for men and women would be that they would be equal in essence and in dignity. In fact, this is what God put in order in the very beginning in, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. It says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. You see, this is, God image. This is what God's image is, that he would make us created um, in his own image, in his own likeness. And while Moses is writing this in in Genesis 1, he's not talking about physical appearance. Obviously, he's not talking about a man with a gray beard. He, He says, male and female, he created us in his own likeness. So the image of God, uh, the Latin word for it is the imago Dei, is not about physical appearance. But what is it? Well, to be made in the image of God, which means we have emotions, We have thoughts, we have longings, we have passions, we have yearnings. That's what makes us different than animals. Yes, a dog might whimper when we leave and go out of town. They might have a short period of separation anxiety. But it's not the same as when we see our kids graduate high school or get married. We might feel, we feel something much deeper than our dogs and than our cats when our dogs or cats, they have a litter, they're not thinking, well, I really hope they grow up to meet another really wonderful dog one day and get married and have a wonderful life. No, when we have children, our heart grows and expands and we have this capacity to love this child just as much as we do our spouse almost immediately. That we wake up in the middle of the night and we worry about them. We think about them deeply. We, we even do that with our friendships and our relationships. When there's something not right in a friendship or a connection, when there's disconnection, we feel something so much more than any other created thing. Why? Because we're made in the image of God. We're made for this deep longing and deep connection more than any other living thing. This is what God's done. He's made us different. He's given us a capacity to connect deeper than any other thing. And we are like any other thing. We are unlike any other thing that God's created, which means we, human beings, male and female, have dignity and worth. 
that we have value because we're created in the image of God. You see, this is where our value actually comes from. Our value doesn't come from uh, what we do or what friends we have or how much money we have. It doesn't come from whether or not we're married or have a significant other. Our value was given to us when God breathed life into us and created us as a person made in his image. And he says he's done that with male and female. All of us are created in his image. Every nationality, every race all have value because we're created in the image of God. So what ends up happening when you remove God from his rightful place in society, we always, always end up creating a system of superiority where women are not valued, where one race is better than the other, and it's completely against the imago Dei, the image of God. And you know what it is? It's just sin. It's just sin. Any kingdom, any culture, any church that doesn't treat all people, male or female, or any race, or any mental capacities, any handicaps, any disabilities, any level of giftedness, anyone who doesn't do that with mutual respect and dignity is not a biblical culture. This applies to the poor beggar on the street, to the rich man on the mountaintop. This applies to the person on their deathbed, to the unborn baby in her mother's womb. Any kingdom, any culture, any church that doesn't treat all people with dignity and worth is sin. And without God, this sin just perpetuates. And this is what's happening under King Xerxes. This is what this kingdom is. It's a kingdom where it seems that God is not there. But look at what happens. Verse 19. If it please the king, let a royal order go, before, go out from him. This is, again, the eunuch talking to Xerxes. And let it be written among the laws of the Persians in the Medes so, that, uh, so um, that it may not be repelled, repealed that Vashti is never again to come before King Xerxes and let her, ki- let her king give her royal position to another who is better than she. So when the cre- creed, when the decree rather, was um, made by the king, it's proclaimed throughout his kingdom, for it was vast, all women will give honor to their husbands, high and low alike. This advice pleased the king, and the princes, and the king did as Mucha proposed. And he sent letters to all the royal providences, to every providence in its own uh, script, and to every people in its own language, that every man be the master of his own household, and to speak according to the language of his people. I want you to see the insecurities of these men. They pass an edict that the ladies are no longer allowed to have their own opinions. And I hope that you can see the irony here. These guys have conquered the known world, and they're afraid of opinionated women. And make no mistake about it, they are not strong men. They are weak and insecure men. And you have these men who are only going to use women as objects, not seen in the Imago day. And so if you're on the outside, if you're a minority like the Hebrews were in these days, the Jewish people, God's people, it would seem like the world is run by wicked and sexually perverse Persian men. It would almost seem like evil is winning. If you ever wonder what the world looks like in a completely godless state, you would look at the kingdom of Xerxes. There's no equality. People are treated as objects. There's only superiority, and there's only Xerxes is king, and nothing else matters. But friends, this is not the end of the story. There's redemption ahead of us in this story. There's a hope and a God who is going to intervene. And here's the thing, we don't see it right now, which is actually the cliffhanger in chapter one, but because this is a book of the Bible, uh, we know that there is going to be a better outcome and that a better kingdom will rise up. And otherwise, it's a pretty awful story. 
And so friends, it may seem that God is not active, that God is absent, but this is not the God of the Bible. This is not the God of this story, and this is not the God of your story. That we don't worship a passive God, we worship an active God. And even among the most powerful and richest and seemingly wisest kings, God still moves. I'm blown away by God's movement throughout the Bible through using righteous and unrighteous kings. Proverbs 21, Solomon writes this about himself, but he's speaking of all kingdoms. He says, the king's heart is a stream of water in the land of, in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. What's the king's heart? He says, it's a stream of water in the hands of the Lord. What does he do? He turns it however he wills. This is what God does with all kingdoms and all rulers and all principalities. I can use multiple examples from scripture, but let me just give you one. The book of Ezra is another uh, interesting story, and it it begins with a Persian king, just like the, the book of Esther. And there's a king, his name is Cyrus. And the book of Ezra, like Esther, it opens up with this wicked king. And in this scene, the, the Israelites, they've been captured for years before, and they've been taken into the captivity of the Babylons. And prior to their leaving, the prophet Jeremiah had prophesied that they would be taken into captivity because of their sin, but would return in 70 years. But get this, at the moment he prophesied this, guess what happened? God moved upon who? A pagan king to do what? To accomplish his purposes to restore a people. And so Ezra opens up similarly to Esther in that it talks about this wicked king, but notice what it says. Ezra chapter one, verse one. Now in the, in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord, what? Stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom and also put in his writing saying, thus says Cyrus, the king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth that he appointed me to build his house in Jerusalem, which is Judah. You see, God, when he seems absent, we have to remember that he's always moving. In the hearts of the godly, and also in the hearts of the ungodly, that God is sovereignly orchestrating a story that is right for us and for his own glory. And this is good news, church, because if you ever feel like God's absent, you are not alone. If you ever feel like God doesn't hear you, that God doesn't see you, because if you really did see what was happening in your life, why would he allow it? Why would he allow your pain? Why would he allow your sorrow? Why would he allow your despair? Sometimes you would even read through the Psalms and you read the Psalms of David. David will say, how long, O Lord, will your wickedness prevail? And I won't pretend this morning to know all the complexities of those questions, but I can bring you to two scenes in Jesus's life where Jesus himself felt perhaps abandoned by God. One is the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus is praying right before he would inevitably go to the cross. And it's one of the scenes of the Bible where Jesus was actually found as distressed. That he's asked the Father, Father, as he's praying, is there any other way, meaning is there any other way to salvation that wouldn't require him to go to the cross? And here's what he's met with with this question. He's asking this question, is there any other way? Is there any other way that you could bring salvation that's not going to require me to go to the cross? And what happens? Jesus, God, rather, the Father, is silent. Perhaps for the first time ever, Jesus hears nothing from the Father. And then the other scene you have, you have the Garden of Gethsemane, and here's the other scene, the cross, where Jesus was beaten, tortured, Nails driven through his hands, through his feet, a crown of thorns placed on his head. Jesus Christ, who lived the life that we should have lived, perfect and 
sinless, died the death that we should have died, died as one who was guilty, although innocent. And here he is right before he breathes his last breath. He cries out, my God, my God, why have you what? Forsaken me. Why have you left me? Why are you silent? You see, even Jesus experienced the absence of God. But church, was Jesus forsaken? Was God really silent? Did God, the Father, allow his Son to be conquered, to be taken by death? The answer is no. Because three days later, we had the most miraculous event in human history, that Jesus rose from the grave. You see, church, it seemed that God was absent. It seemed that God was silent. But there was a resurrection ahead. And that's the God that we serve. So when it seems that God is silent, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it proves that he will not forsake his beloved. And here's the good news of the gospel. If you are a believer in Christ, there is resurrection, there is redemption in every story that he's not forsaken you, that he's a loving God, loving God, who even in God's silence is actively pursuing your heart. He's actively using what you are going through in order to make you more like him. And that's the promise of the gospel. And so here's what we have this morning. We have this painful story that seemingly has, a ho- that has no hope. But we know because of history that God is going to ra- raise up another kingdom, a greater kingdom, a truer kingdom. And so church, in your despair, I'm going to invite you that you would trust that God is providentially moving, that there is redemption, that there is resurrection, even in wickedness and injustice and hurt. My my invitation to you, church, is to turn to Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, who is a truer and better king, than Xerxes. Jesus Christ, who is a true Lord of Lords. Jesus Christ, who is the heavenly Father, who loves you and knows you by name, who sees you and who's drawing you to himself. So church, my invitation is that you would turn to Christ today. Maybe you feel like you're in this scene here, that you feel the world around you is crashing down, that you feel like you are in despair, that you feel like it is hopeless ahead. But I want to remind you, because of the resurrection, because we know that Christ has risen, that we can trust him, that we can trust him even in our story. God, help us. Let's pray. Jesus, we're grateful for this reminder today that even when it seems that you are absent, that your providential hand is at work, and that you're making all things new, and that you're rising up your own kingdom for your name's sake, and that you're calling us, your people, sons and daughters, to love you, to trust you, and to abide in you. And so God, I pray that we would do that this morning. I pray that we would submit to your lordship, that you are the king of all kings, that you are greater than Xerxes, that you are greater than any king or ruler or principality. And not only that, but you love us, you know us, You sent your son to die for us. And Lord, because of that, we know that in every one of our stories, there's this hope of resurrection. There's this hope of redemption. And so God, I pray for those in this room who've never trusted you. I pray, Lord, that your spirit would soften their hearts to the gospel, that you would grant them faith to repent and to believe and to surrender to you. And Lord, for those of us who love you, I pray, Lord, that we would trust you even in our story, that you're with us and that your providential hand is always at work. So God, we love you, and we surrender to you today. In Jesus' name, amen.